So in this video, I'd like to explore distinguishing an offer from other conduct. In particular, I'm going to talk about invitations to treat. So in other words, we're going to explore when something that looks like it might be an offer isn't an offer and when it is. Um, so let's start before we get into invitations to treat and just having a quick think about why we need to make that distinction. Now you've already thought about this in the context of Gibson uh, where we explored a document that was probably an invitation to treat or a, um, an invitation to negotiate or make an application and we've thought about it in the context of Carl Hill and Carbolic Smokeball uh, where there were some arguments that the extraordinary amount of money that you would get paid in the event that uh, the puffball didn't work was not in fact a promise to pay that money but a puff or a boast about how fabulous or exciting uh, this technology is. Um, other kinds of conduct that come into uh, the picture when we deal with this include uh, supplying information. Um, and it's important to understand what the role is of offer and acceptance in the context of auctions and tenders. So we'll explore all of those in turn. Um, I specifically in this video, I want to focus on invitations to treat. An invitation to treat is part of a preliminary negotiation to signify an invitation to submit an offer. So the letter in Gibson was an invitation to treat. It was an invitation to make an application to purchase the council house. Sometimes invitations to treat are the display of goods in a physical location, in a shop window, on a shelf. Sometimes they might be advertisements. These days that might include uh, having something in stock in an online store or on a Facebook ad or some other social media. So let's explore each of them by reference to the cases. There are, actually, before we do that, here's another slide I prepared earlier. Um, it's worth noting that even though an invitation to treat isn't an offer, and as a consequence, it may not be that the terms set out in the invitation to treat are the same as terms contained in an offer and therefore an agreement, um, it doesn't mean that you can just do or say anything in an invitation to treat on the basis that it won't become a contract term later. Uh, section 18 of the Australian Consumer Law prohibits misleading or deceptive conduct in trade or commerce. Um, in many of the cases, because we deal with a lot of older cases in this subject, you'll see references to Section 52 of the Trade Practices Act. Basically, that's exactly the same as Section 18 of the ACL, or the Australian Consumer Law. Uh, the Trade Practices Act, or the TPA as it's often referred to, was replaced by the Competition and Consumer Act in 2011. And the Australian Consumer Law is the... Um, the schedule is Schedule 2 to that Act and sets out most of the consumer laws uh, that are applicable to the kind of contracts that we're dealing with. I'll point out the sections that you need to become familiar with as we work through the subject, um, but sections 18 and 29 are a really good place to start. Uh, so ultimately, as a matter of the way that those sections work, is an invitation to treat or the term set out in an invitation to treat may in fact become a collateral contract so a side contract which requires the person making that invitation to be bound by the procedures that they set out in the invitation even though they don't form part of the contract itself so for example the if you are going to say in an invitation to treat that you will sell at a a lesser price to the first 500 customers, then you will be bound by the Australian Consumer Law to in fact make a, keep a record of who the first 500 customers are and sell to them at that lower price. The other thing to think about is as you listen to these cases or as we read these cases and you listen to me talk about them, is try and make sure that you're distinguishing between an offer and an invitation to treat. It really is as simple as asking, is somebody making an offer, which once accepted will form a contract, or is someone inviting another party to make an offer? And then it's only if the offer is made that it can be accepted and a contract is formed. 
So one of the older English cases that we look at is Fisher and Bell from 1961. This is actually a criminal law case. So there was some legislation that prohibited the offer for sale of flick knives. So a particular store that had flick knives in the window with a price tag attached to them, um, so the owner of the store was charged with breaching this particular provision of a relevant piece of criminal legislation. And they argued and were ultimately successful that they were not actually offering for sale, that all they were doing was displaying them in the window, which was an invitation to treat. And any offer that was made was correspondingly made by the potential purchaser. And the court found this to be the case. They held that in the absence of any definition in the Act, extending the meaning of offer for sale, so in other words, this could have been fixed by the legislation, including in the definition of offer for sale, that that would include the display of goods for sale, that the term itself, the term here being offer for sale, needed to be given the meaning attributed to it by the ordinary laws of contract. And the ordinary law of contract says if you put goods in a window or in a display case, that that is an invitation to others to treat with you. It's an invitation to treat and not an offer for sale. And as a consequence of not being an offer for sale, there could be no acceptance which constituted a contract. Very similar outcome uh, in Partridge and Crittenden, a 1968, another British case, Basically very similar facts. Rather than the shop window, this time Mr Partridge, uh, who wanted to sell his bamboo kit, finch, cocks and hens, clearly he liked partridges better, um, he wanted to sell them. He put an advertisement in the Cajun Avery Birds magazine. There was a local ordinance that made it a criminal offence to sell those birds and he was received a fine for offering to sell them contrary to the law. He appealed the decision and ultimately it was held that there had been no offer to sell, that the legislation couldn't be contravened because all he had done is sought invitations to treat. So he'd made an invitation to treat to seek offers. The seminal case here is Boots Cash Chemist. Um, many of you will have been to the UK, you will know what a Boots Cash Chemist is like or a Boots as they're referred to. I don't even know if they have cash in their name anymore. Um, they're like mega pharmacies, um, sort of like our discount chemists, not necessarily discount though, um, but on speed. Um, I've been to one near Liverpool station that's two stories. Uh, Massive sells all kinds of pharmaceuticals, but also a whole lot of health and wellness products, personal items, etc. Um, so they started out in the 1950s and they really revolutionised the business model for chemists. Um, the Pharmaceutical Society of Great Britain is effectively the club or the industry association, you might even call it a union, for pharmacists. And back in 1953, most pharmacists were small business owners. They had small chemist shops that did things the way that they'd always done them. Then along comes Boots with their massive floor plan. This is a picture of Boots in the 1950s. And you can see it looks a little bit like a supermarket. There are shelves, you get a basket, you can uh, go around, pick up what you like, and you take it to the cashier. So, um, there was a section in their store that displayed goods which could be bought without the supervision of a pharmacist. And there was another section where the pharmacist um, supervised what was happening, so the drugs that were behind the counter. There was a provision in the relevant legislation, the Pharmacy and Poisons Act of 1933, which made it unlawful for a person to sell certain kinds of drugs unless the sale is affected by or under supervision of a registered pharmacist. Um, the pharmacist in Boots uh, was near the registers, uh, and so they stood at the exit to the store and they supervised the purchases from there. But the Pharmaceutical Society argued that this was not good enough. So the issue in this case is whether when a customer picked up the drugs to which this legislation applied um, and put them in the basket, so when they made use of the self-service, they had purchased the drugs and therefore concluded the contract. The, um, uh, the Pharmaceutical Society 
uh, said that the process was not under the supervision of a registered pharmacist. Um, and they said that the pharmaceutical legislation hadn't been followed and that Boots was effectively um, doing the wrong thing and that they should change their business model. Um, but, uh, the, the Pharmaceutical Society argued that the drugs had been purchased and the contract had been made when the customer put the drugs into the basket. And because this wasn't supervised by the pharmacist, the legislation had been contravened. On the other hand, Boots argued that the legislation hadn't been contravened because only when a customer took drugs to the cash register was any kind of offer made. And it was when we were at the cash register that the pharmacist could supervise that part of the transaction. So, for example, if they saw that somebody was purchasing inappropriate drugs or if they purchased too many drugs uh, or that there was some other issue with the drugs that they had purchased, they could actually put a stop to the transaction. The sale, they said, was affected by or under the supervision of a registered pharmacist as the legislation required. Um, and the, ultimately the court agreed with them. Lord Justice Somerville said that if the Pharmaceutical Society's argument would be right, then once an article had been placed in the basket, the customer would be bound and to buy it. They would have no right without paying for the article to substitute an article which they saw of a similar kind or which they decided that they liked. They would have no right to return it. Uh, they would be bound at the point that they put it in the basket to pay for it and go on their way. Ultimately, this is what an invitation to treat is. It's the display of goods in a shop window, in a display case, on a website, in printed materials. It's the display of information about services in a similar way. It is not an offer of those goods or services, but an opportunity for a customer or potential customer to look at those goods, to make an assessment of those goods, think about those services, and then ultimately by taking them physically to a cashier or by filling in a form on the web or by making a phone call, offering to purchase those goods or services or not, as the case may be. As always, questions, comments, send them to me.